Good morning. My name is Ian Austin, and I just got back from a 10-day trip to Wyoming, the Grovemont Wilderness, deserts near Farson, and in the Snowy Range as well. First two days, we stayed um, on the Sweetwater River, which is near Farson, out there in the in the sagegrass area, deserty area, just south of the Wind River Range. Um, spent two days there, like I said before. The first day, we got there uh, about noonish. Uh, we set up camp fished a little bit on the sweet water, and then drove around scouting for sage grouse. As we're driving, Grandpa came up on two. They popped up. He shot both of them, and you'll see his review here in a little bit about that. And then um, we're driving some more, and I see a big bull grouse. I'm talking huge, like the size of this pillow right here, sitting in the road, and he wasn't going anywhere. So I get out, have my bow with me, and I shoot at that grouse, and I missed him plain as day. I'm talking yards away from him. And I was so discouraged because I thought my shooting was so bad. But come to find out, it wasn't my shooting. It was actually what I had on the tips of my arrows. I had adders, which are like big bear claws that you stick on there. And they're designed to stop or punch your target rather than penetrate it. So those were catching the wind and throwing my arrows way off. Um, so missed him. Went back to bed that night and then woke up the next morning, fished for uh, maybe an hour. It was so cold, my rod had ice going all the way down. It was crazy. Um, so we did that. Uh, fished for a little while. Got some video of that. You'll see it here in a little bit. No fish, just just a video. Um, it's a pretty canyon in the background. It was really nice. And then we packed everything up in the car and we headed towards the Grovemont. On the way to the Grovemont, we jumped on the Oregon Trail which is right next to where we were camping. And we drove on it for a little while, and we kept seeing all these prairie dogs. Uh, it was really neat. And so I jumped out, and I was like, hey, I think I can shoot one of these prairie dogs with my bow. I hadn't figured out that the adders were the problem with my shooting yet. So you'll see here in a moment, in slow motion, hopefully I can get this video to do it, but in slow motion, you'll see my arrow come swooping down at this prairie dog as he's ducking. And it missed him probably by three inches. And then my arrow goes flying off in the distance. Um, so I missed him. And then we kept driving. And I said, forget it with this longbow stuff. So I got my shotgun out. And we keep driving. And a bunch of sage grouse are out here in the road. Just off the road. We see them in the distance. So we jump out. Kind of run out their little ways. And we shoot two sage grouse. I shot one. And I believe my dad shot one. Uh, Grandpa couldn't get his bow out of his, or his gun out of his truck. So... Shoot two sage grouse. That was my first sage grouse ever, and Dad's like 15th or something. I don't know. Sage grouse are really special. If you look them up, and I might post a little picture of them here later, uh, during their mating season, they puff up real big like turkeys do, and they have these big air sacs on their chest that they inflate, and it makes like this drumming noise. It's super neat. They got big tail fans that look like this. Um, but yeah, they're really cool. Um, so I shot my first sage grouse that day. Uh, we kept driving, and we see more prairie dogs, and I had finally figured out that it was the adders at this point that was affecting my shot. And so I took those off, and I'm about 25 yards away, and this prairie dog mound is right smack dab in the middle of the road. Um, wind is howling and all that crazy stuff. So I draw back my bow, and I let it fly, and the next thing you see is this prairie dog flopping in the road with the arrows sticking through his neck. I felt so bad that I didn't have the adders on because a field tip's not going to do anything to kill a prairie dog. So he's flopping around and finally we dispatch him and all that. Um, but that was my 25-yard prairie dog shot where most guys are taking 500-yard shots with their rifles at them. I'm smoking them with a longbow. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, following that, we finally made it up to the Grovant, drove through Pinedale and, and um, all that stuff and finally came up into Jackson, Wyoming. Got my picture by the artist. You'll see that too. Um, and then we get to camp. Um, we got camp set up. I uh, got a couple videos made with me, dad, and grandpa, and you'll see those as well. Um, got some videos with them, and then settled down for the night. Um, woke up the next morning, and then we hiked all the way up to first. We went to Broken Arrow Bottoms, and you'll see a video of dad explaining why we call it Broken Arrow Bottoms. Him and my grandpa, Lanny, uh, went up there back in 91, I believe is what he said. Um, and as he was going up, they were walking up, and he shoots this stump. And the stump 
was so hard at the time that it broke his arrow, and so they called it Broken Arrow Bottoms, and the arrow is still there to this day in 2017, which is really neat. Uh, we found it, did a little story on it. So head up through Broken Arrow Bottoms and then up to Bugle Brook, and I didn't get any view videos of Bugle Brook because we could not actually find the camp. Um, there was a bunch of blowdowns, and, and the terrain was so different that, um, that we couldn't actually find it. So... Went on past that, and then we went up to Fossil Point, where uh, the last elk camp was, um, and that was 1996, I believe. Up there in 2007, me and Grandpa buried a time capsule. Um, I was I was really young, so I didn't really know what to put in a time capsule, so I threw in a couple coins, and I wrote a little letter to myself, things of that nature. Um, so as soon as we got up to the very top, you can see I built a carn on top of it in 2007, so it's this big old pile of rocks. And as soon as we come over the hill, you can see that carn. So I ran over to it, and I finally dug up the time capsule, pulled it out while Dad and Grandpa were going to find the elk camp, um, walked back over to the elk camp with the time capsule, and we sat there, and we opened it up, and we did a few things. Uh, you know, we looked in it, read the letters, and then we put a bunch of stuff in there. I wrote a new letter to myself. Um, I put a bunch of clippings in there from high school and college football, and then... I uh, put a few other things in there, lots of pictures of past hunts um, in Wyoming and Oklahoma and Arkansas and things of that nature. Put those in there, and then Grandpa put a few things in there, and then we sealed it back up, and then we reburied it in the same spot. Um, so if anybody is interested in digging up that time capsule, I'll be up there in 10 years. But you guys can go in the future and sign your name on the bottom of it and all that stuff. It is in the Grovant Wilderness. You take the Soda Creek Trail all the way up to the top, and there's this big old clearing with lots of fossils and stuff on it from uh, back in the flood days. And on that clearing is a big old carn, probably five foot tall carn. And you can dig it up and you can look inside of it and see what we buried in 2007 and 2017. So um, after that, we took a bunch of pictures, uh, me and dad next to it. And the cool thing is if you look at it from the elk camp, straight in line, you can see Grand Teton in the background, and you, you'll see a picture, and I'll zoom in on the picture later. You can see Grand Teton in the background. It's super, super cool. Came down the mountain, and about halfway down, it started raining really bad. Um, so, <laughs> if anybody's ever been up to the Grovant or anywhere in Wyoming, once it starts raining, you know that you're stuck there for a long time because it never dries out, and it turns slicker than grease up there. I'm talking... You bust open a tube of axle grease and you spread it on the road, and that's what it's like. So we were stuck up there for a few days. In that time, we fished. Uh, we did a lot of camping. We did a lot of sitting around by the campfire and trying to stay warm um, because the next morning after it rained, it snowed. So we were snowed in slash rained in, uh, sitting there for a few days. And finally, some, some people that were staying at a dude ranch about three, four miles away came up on their UTV and we talked to him, and I asked him to, to send a, le a letter, or a, not a letter, a text to my mom. They told me they couldn't text, so they called my mom, told her why I couldn't make it back to Jackson to have breakfast with her. And then they went and told the ranger uh, of that district that we were stuck up there, and he came up and talked to us. Long story short, the next morning it froze so much that we were able to get out on the ice on top of the mud, which was really cool, and you'll see a video of that too. I thought we were going to be slipping and sliding all the way down. But it turns out that it was hard enough where we could actually just really cruise down really easily. So we get down that, and we went to a local KOA camp. If you guys have never stayed at a KOA camp, I've been staying at them my whole life. They are fantastic. Think of a really nice RV park slash tent campsite ground, um, and then multiply it times 10, and that's how great KOA camps are. Great Wi-Fi, great amenities. This one was right on the Snake River, so I fished that for a while. And then we left there and went to Yellowstone, made a quick trip up to Yellowstone. It only took an hour and a half, two hours to get up there from Pinedale or Hoback Junction where we were staying. Went up to Yellowstone and I wanted to see Old Faithful again. We took a few pictures in Yellowstone and then jumped up to Old Faithful, watched that go off. And then as soon as that went off, we headed back towards, um, towards Hoback. I stayed there that night, got some homework done, and then we headed out... Um, and on the way out, we stopped in Jackson. I had breakfast with my mom, finally. Um, had breakfast with her, my Uncle Johnny, who is 81 years old, I believe. And he drove all the way up from Florida to, to get away from the hurricanes. 
drove all the way up from Florida, and we had breakfast with him, my Mimi, Susan, and my Papa, Lanny, and my dad had breakfast at the Bunnery Cafe right there in Jackson. If you guys ever stop in Jackson, be sure to eat at the Bunnery. They have great food. Ate at the Bunnery, left there, and we went down to the Snowy Range, which is over by Laramie, uh, a couple hours outside of Laramie, maybe one. Um, stayed up there for the remainder of the trip. Um, while we were in Laramie, here's the thing. Um, up in the Snowy Range, the campgrounds are at about 10,000 feet, which is about as high as we hiked in where my time capsule is. So we're camping at 10,000 feet, so it's hard to breathe and, you know, all this stuff. Camping there, and there's so many lakes and rivers around, it was just unreal fishing. Uh, we caught rainbows and brook trout, uh, cutties, you know, and then we went chasing some grayling. We heard that there was some grayling in some local lakes, but we never found any. But what was interesting is if you're a fly fisher, you know what a scud is, right? So a scud is a freshwater shrimp, and they're about this big normally. But up there in those alpine lakes, they are huge scuds. I'm talking like normal-sized shrimp. It is weird. And they're all swimming around. And I was like, grayling ought to be gorging on these things. Anyways, didn't find any grayling, but we did take a little off-road trip, which was really cool. I should have videoed it. Uh, we took a two-wheel drive Suburban up there, which is a big old, I'm talking like station wagon deal. All right. And we're on these roads that normal rock crawlers would hesitate to go on. It was pretty sketchy. But we found an old log cabin up there. Grandpa did some metal detecting, found a cool mug, and then we headed back to camp. Next morning we got up, fished a little while, um, found some brook trout in this little stream right below camp. I counted probably 90 brook trout in this stream. I'm not kidding. Most brook trout I've ever seen in my life. So... <laughs> Go from there, and then we hit a couple smaller lakes up there in the mountains, caught some rainbows, and then this hatch happened. This, this, thunder, this thunderstorm rolled by, all this thunder was going off, and then you talk about the bugs. The bugs came down like rain, dude, and the rainbows were just sitting there jumping out of the water left after, you know, it was crazy, eating all these bugs. It was insane. I didn't catch a single fish, by the way. Don't know why. I'm a bad fisherman, I guess, but... Caught all these rainbows. Go back to camp, and the next morning is my birthday. We wake up, we eat breakfast, we celebrate, and we packed up the truck, and we headed home because I was tired of being wet and cold. So that was it. That was our trip. It was a fun trip. The drive home was awful. The wind was horrid. Um, you know, it was it was it was an awful drive home. It was just hot and windy. Um, but overall, the trip was a phenomenal trip, and. I don't know if you, any of you guys have ever experienced this, but I grew up in a household where we hunted all year round, and we hiked, and we fished, and we camped, and if you if you haven't done that, if you haven't experienced that, you really need to get out and try that, because that's really the only way to, you know, experience what God has created in the world, is, is go immerse yourself in it. So, go out, have some fun in the wilderness area, or in a local, you know, wildlife management area, or the national forest, or a lake nearby or whatever, but go enjoy nature. And that's why we do this. Every five years, we go up to the to the Grovant and up in Wyoming. You know, um, went to Colorado last year with James Ratcliffe and Joel Ferguson, my stepdad and Joel Maxwell. Went elk hunting there, you know, and it was just a great trip. And if you guys don't ever get the chance to do that, you're really missing out. So be sure to, um, be sure to try that. And then enjoy the video and the pictures and all that stuff that's gonna follow this. So have a great night, see you guys later, bye. Hello, it is Saturday, this area right in here. and we made it to the Sweetwater.
so earlier you guys heard me talk about when we set up camp and we got there and then we drove around and went hunting for a little while, uh, driving the roads just to see what it was like and the sage grouse jumped up. Uh, here in a moment you'll see Grandpa giving his short little review of the hunt. Um, I'm going to give you the true review right now and then you can see his and we'll, you'll figure out what, what the difference is. Um, so we're driving around and uh, two sage grouse were sitting right on the ditch of the road um, and so we stopped about 20 yards away and jumped out. Now grouse, if you don't know about grouse, are not really skittish creatures. They'll sit there for a long time before you get to them um, and so you really have ample time to make your shot. So we stopped 20 yards away, you know, pretty close to them. Grandpa shoots them both and drops them dead in their tracks. Probably not 20 yards off the road. So we run over there and he gets, I get one of his birds and he's over there messing with his other bird, which is still halfway alive, didn't die all the way yet. So I grab it and I dispatch it really quickly. Um, so stay tuned and you'll see what grandpa's rendition of the story is. So they got out of your water. Walked probably for four or five miles, finally got a chance to get a shot. Chased him down, chased him probably a quarter mile. Anyway, we got him. Here they are. This supper for tonight. Oh, that's a load of crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we've seen um, Grandpa's side of the story, and you can see my little my little buddy Gator here with me. Um, but you see Grandpa's side of the story. Not very true. So, <laughs> um, anyways. Next day, like I said before, fish a little while, and I'll throw in a clip of that, just fishing in the valley. Um, and then we drove, and I shot my first sage grouse, which I didn't get a video of, but you'll have a picture of it. I miss a prairie dog. You'll see that in the video. And then I shot a prairie dog with my bow, and I didn't get a video of it, but I got a picture of it. So I'll throw it on there. And maybe I'll get Dad to send me a video he took of right after I killed it. It's not really viewer-friendly. It's kind of sad. But it's part of hunting, um, you know, and you got to deal with bad shots and situations like that. So uh, stay tuned. We'll, uh, we'll throw those on here in a second. So as you can see, uh, actually you probably can't see in this video, but um, it is about... 20 degrees right now. Um, I've got my big heavy coat on on top of my waders. Uh, Dad's standing in the river filming, but um, my rod had ice covering the guides. So casting this rod was a pain in the butt. Um, and in the end of the video, you will see, um, you actually hear me ask Dad if my fly came flying off the end of that because it was so coated in ice that it was so heavy, I figured it would have whipped off in that cast. Um, so enjoy the little clip. Uh, this is again the Sweetwater River. Uh, but there you go. See a flag up flying off there? I didn't see one on the end of it, I don't think. We're gonna shoot this prairie dog, boys. And girls. With, with what? This bow right here in my hand. Head up. All right, this video is kind of long, but right now you're seeing this prairie dog squealing at me. He's finally seen me, and then you just saw my shot. I'll replay it in slow motion in a second. But, but what you'll see is my shot. Seriously, the wind caught it and moved it about three inches low. I missed the prairie dog, and this is what I was talking about earlier in the video. Uh, right now, I'm walking back up to him. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty disappointed at this at this moment in time. And then earlier that day, or earlier the day before, uh, I had missed a big grouse. So at, at this time right now, I am seriously pretty upset at my shooting. And I, I'm kind of contemplating whether or not to put the bow away for the rest of the trip. Um, to miss two, two animals at 20 yards is, is pretty poor in my opinion. Now some people would say with a long bow, you know, a prairie dog and a bird at 20 yards is, is pretty hard to hit. On, on, in my case, I think that's a pretty easy shot. I mean, I, I hit spray paint cans at 30 yards pretty consistently. Um, 
So we'll replay this video and uh, hopefully in slow motion where you can see this a little better. We head back here to St. Josh and slid up the hump. All right, so let's watch this shot right here. You're gonna hear my bow go off here in just a second. There's the arrow, bam, she is gone. Uh, so, pretty disappointing, but oh well, what can you do, right? All right, so here's my prairie dog from before. I actually did kill one. All right, I wanted to take the next few moments to explain that the next video you're gonna see is pretty graphic, um, and that if you're squirmish in any way, please avoid watching it. Um, the squirming is part of its death cycle, and that's all it is. Understand that uh, as hunters, we try to make the most ethical shots that we can, um, and sometimes we, we fall short of that. Uh, you'll see in this next video that the prairie dog is still squirming a little bit. He's, he's still alive. Um, he is dying, though. Um, but he was dispatched. He didn't feel a lot of pain. I can guarantee that. Um, but that's all it is. We do feel remorse for the creatures. Um, and we do feel sad about it. It's it's just part of life, and, and that's what it is. So um, enjoy if you want. But, but this is part of it, so I figured I'd share it with you guys. Thank you. Okay. Hang on, Levy. <laughs> Holy Ganito. So here's my sage grouse, and in a moment you're going to see me and Dad's sage grouses together. Um, but once again, really look these birds up. I'm not going to have enough time to put a picture of one on here, but they're beautiful, beautiful birds. Alrighty, so at this time, we have made it up to the Grovant, and we've set up camp. Uh, and in the following videos, there's going to be three videos. Um, you're going to see Grandpa first, and then my dad, and then myself. And we're kind of explaining why we do this trip and why we go up there. And also, our time capsule is a little bit more. Um, later on, I'll go into further detail on the time capsules and explain to you uh, kind of the, the significance of it. Um, so enjoy these. Uh, you'll have a have a couple laughs with Grandpa and Dad. Um, you got to suffer through my video, but um, enjoy once again. All right, Chef. Is it on? All right, it's on. I'm Fred Austin. I'm up here in the Grovant Wilderness area in Teton County, Wyoming with my son Brian and his son, my grandson, Ian. Right now, as you can see, we're getting ready to do a little cooking here. I moved up here in 89 and started hunting in this area in 1990. And Brian's been up here with me several years since that time. I don't know when he first came, he could tell you. And we had an elk camp and maybe we'll get a picture of it later or something as far as a distance picture, about seven miles up in the mountains, about uh, 10,000 feet. Rode the horses up there, hunted elk, hunted blue and rough grouse, which is what we're going to do tomorrow. Uh, anyway, so this is another another hunt we made. We done it, we started when I was age 60. We did another in 65, and now here we are at 870. So we're kind of like, like to do this on a return basis like that. I may have some more later, so Ian, talk to somebody or Dad, and I'll see what else I want to put on there. Well, Dad mentioned my name earlier. I'm Brian Austin, and the guy behind the camera is my son, Ian Austin. And I've been coming up since 91. I first came up and fished the first year. And right now I'm trying to get the fireplace and things organized. So, came up in 91 and fished, and then came up and started elk hunting and deer hunting after that, years after that. And the uh, last deer camp, elk camp, that we had was in 1996. My Uncle Bob Austin, Robert Austin, Dad and I came up in 96 and we hunted up at the top deer camp, the highest one, and uh, came up early. We bow hunted, Dad and I bow hunted. Uncle shot a plethora of grouse that year with a shotgun. Uh, neither one of us had any success bow hunting, although we came very close. Both of us took a shot. Dad shot at a nice, big, huge 6x6. I shot at a very good size 5x5. Um, during bow season. Uh, I think 
the first day of gun season in 96, my uncle took a six by six. The next day, um, second day of gun season, I took a six by six and dad took a nice three by three mule deer, maybe a mule deer whitetail cross that year. And uh, so that was the end of, uh, that was the end of the actual elk camp, elk hunts. Out of all the years that it went on from 90 to 96, I do not believe that there was ever a time that there was an, a 100% success rate. So people that came up with me was Jimmy Turner, a friend of mine from high school came up with me. He ended up killing a uh, elk the year that he came up and that may have been 94. Um, Dad had a couple of friends, Herb Pruitt came up, brought a friend of his. Um, Dad had other individuals from around the area come up with him and he may mention those names later. But there was always a complete 100% success rate on deer and elk. Am I right, Dad, on that? The year that, I forgot, Greg or Corey came up. Yeah. He had a shot at a cow and missed it, which who came up. Okay. And I don't remember who came up either that year. That's one of, one of Uncle Bob's kids, Bob Austin's kids came up. So that would be the only time that we didn't have 100% success on that. So over the years, we've killed uh, many of grouse. Um, I killed grouse with my bow. I killed my first elk up here with a bow. And uh, so Ian and I are going to bow hunt for grouse. I'm not sure if we're going to, if I'm going to bow hunt tomorrow. Today we were supposed to be here at noon. We didn't get here until a little after six. My intention was to bow hunt all day today <clears throat> after we got camp set up and then gun hunt tomorrow. So I'm not sure what I will do on that aspect. I may still go ahead and bow hunt, but we'll see how, how tomorrow pans out. That's where we're at now. I'll let uh, Ian set up the tripod and he can talk a little bit about what's going on and his experiences that he's been up here. Ian, give me a shot first. Okay. Got one thing I'll put and, on there. And Grandpa needs shot, he said. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we're coming up here this year for, besides all the camaraderie and the hunting and the fishing we're gonna do later and that sort of thing, is somewhere about 25, 27 years ago, I buried a time capsule. And then about four or five years after that, I buried another time capsule. Now we came up here five years ago to find those time capsules off of the information I wrote down. We didn't find them. So I brought the metal detector this year because each of them's got money in them. Ian and I also, 10 years ago, did a time capsule at where the elk camp is at called Fossil Point. So anyway, I want to tell you about our time capsules because it's a neat thing. We're going to add to the 10 year ago time capsule this time and uh, got some things we're going to put in it. And maybe someday you're going to bring his grandson up here and they can dig it up and see what we all had in there. And this is part of that. This is going to be in that time capsule. So enjoy. Hi, my name is Ian Austin. I'm, uh, I'm number three of the group, grandson and son. Um, we're up here in uh, the Grovant Wilderness in Wyoming. Um, I've been coming up here since 2007. Um, first year we came up here, camped down here where we're at right now, um, and hiked in every day uh, for a few days. Um, and uh, that year we buried a time capsule up on the very top of the mountain, up uh, by 1996 camp. Grandpa called it uh, Fossil Point earlier. Um, buried that and then we looked for some other time capsules as well that he buried up here in the 90s um, but uh, we came back out here it's 2017 this year um, came in 2000 and, uh, I guess 2012 as well um, we came up here in 2017 and we're going to add more to our time capsule which is what this uh, this video is um, and then we're gonna dig it up and look at some other stuff and, and put a few other things in there Put some clippings from football in there and I wrote a letter and things like that um, but uh, we've been out here for a couple days now we stayed on the uh, Sweetwater River the first night uh, fished a little bit didn't catch anything dad caught a fish um, but this morning we went uh, sage grouse hunting killed my first sage grouse um, and then I shot a prairie dog too with my bow today um, so we're having grouse for dinner along with some peas and <laughs> Some peas and some uh, some potatoes. Um, Dad's signing over in the background that he caught a fish. I already told the camera that, by the way. <laughs> Dad caught a 48-inch brown trout. I'm just kidding. It was about nine inches, but it was a pretty fish. Lots of red in it. Um, so yeah, but uh, just wanted to uh, make a little video for this time capsule. Um, 
with all of us in it because I don't know how long we're going to be doing this for. Uh, hopefully a long time. But uh, we're going to have a video so I can show my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids and friends and family that come up here in the future. So um, with that being said, that's it. Uh, hope you guys enjoy. Bye. Alright, in these pictures we made our way up into the wilderness area and we're starting to go up the mountain. Um, me and Dad wanted to get a pretty pretty shot of the sunrise, so we each got one of those, and then you'll see Dad walking in the grass. Next clip you'll see uh, Dad talking about why we named uh, Broken Arrow Bottoms uh, what it see is. The, you see the knock and the arrow. Right here was the shot. So in... 91. You want, you want me to stand behind this dump and you I don't care. back there? 91? I can remember the day. year that Lanny and I came up. Is that what it was? Okay. <laughs> so the trail came up over here on this part of the side over, over there. You can see the angle of the yeah. arrow. So I was down there just about where those trees are. If you want to turn around and look at those little pines. And uh, trail trail came up. So, took a shot, arrow stuck in there, and uh, actually broke the head of it off. And so we left that arrow in there, and I knew I was, I knew I could shoot me an elk, because that was my elk target that day, and I center punched that thing. So I knew I was ready. So that was 1991. That's a Port Orford cedar shaft. It came out of Dick Palmer's bow shop. And unfortunately, you can't see the colors on it right now. And I was curious why it's broken a couple of different spots. That's a Mercury Speed Knock on the back of it. And so we left the arrow here and called this bottoms Broken Arrow Bottoms. And so now it's 2017. Alrighty, the next um, little bit of the video is just going to be a few pictures of us walking up the hill, um, or mountain per se. Uh, there's one of, um, I believe, Dad hunting. Um, we saw some rubbed grouse up by Bugle Brook. And then there's one of me and Grandpa standing by a sign that says Horse Killer Hill. I don't know if you guys can make it out in the picture or not. Um, and the reason Grandpa named it Horse Killer Hill is because he actually had a few horses fall on the hill. It is so steep that you have to almost crawl on all fours to get up it. Um, once you get up Horse Killer Hill, you just have a short ways to go before you reach um, uh, Fossil Point. Um, you just kind of crest over the top of Horse Killer Hill and then uh, walk on a little bowl kind of deal, and then there's Fossil Point. Um, and then you'll see a video of me coming up on the on the Carn with my time capsule under it. And then following that will be a picture um, of once I dug that Carn up and then the time capsule there with the hole. Um, so enjoy those, and then uh, we'll jump on here and explain a little bit more about the time capsule. Down to 800 feet, guys. And this is my time capsule I buried in 2007. I'm going to add more to it. Alrighty, so between the time of digging up the time capsule and putting it back in the ground after we read the letters and stuff like that, we actually sat at Fossil Camp, or 96 Camp as I call it. Um, and we sat there and talked for a while about, you know, uh, things they did there at camp and told stories. And we also did a few things like um, pull the crosscut saw out of a tree and pull the mall, the splitting mall out of a tree up there um, that we left up there in 2012. Now in 2012, I did take an ax down that was up there. Um, it's a Swedish made ax that grandpa used up there uh, to cut down lumber and things like of that nature for camp. Um, but this time, whenever we went up there, we actually pulled the mall down and the crosscut saw. And I'm gonna refurbish those to hang in the horse barn 
uh, that dad's building at his farm in Decatur. Um, so you'll see a video um, th of them talking about that and how they got it up there and why they're bringing it down and things of that nature. Um, so enjoy that. Um, I'll get off of here and then we'll come back on and I'll post some pictures of us burying the time capsule and rebuilding the carn and then some of us uh, just sitting there, uh, you know, with the mountains in the background. Again, if you look real close behind the carn, you'll see the Tetons. I don't know if you can pause it or zoom in or whatever, but you'll see the Tetons, Grand Teton, right in the back over the top of the carn. It's really neat. Well, tell us a story about why is it up here and what you use it for well, and all that stuff. This is all here I found on another trip. It's an old, old camp. It's an abandoned camp. The saw was there. And I brought it out on a wild Mustang. What I did, I just put the longer side, strapped the longer side of her belly, and we rode out, rode out the mountains with it. So I brought it up here to cut plywood for an elk camp. What about that other handle, Pop? The other handle, I don't remember the other handle. It's been too many years. It didn't have a handle when we got it. I don't think we ever just put one on it. But that's the original handle that was on it. Whether that's an original handle or some else handle, I don't know. But there it is. And my son wants to take it, and he's saying about going in the lumber jacket. <laughs> jack and lumber. I'm not sure what he's going to do. Well, actually, what's going to happen is we're building a bunkhouse. We call it the horse barn. And it's going to hang up multiple antiques, photographs of family functions, activities. It's going to have four bedrooms in it, bathroom, kitchen, den area, big, the center of the horse barn. Is when everybody comes home for family reunions or holidays, we'll set up picnic tables in the center and uh, have everybody gather around it. Open up the doors, let the breeze roll through, shut them, turn the heater on. But these things are going to hang up. And so this was last used up here in 1996. We talked about some of that stuff earlier on some other videos. There's a mall. You can see an Ian's backpack right there. If you can see the handle. That was also brought up here in 96. So it is 2017. 21 years later now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these items out. What do you brought here in 96? Bring it up here in the last time it was used was in 96. Yeah, I brought that up somewhere in the early 90s. Yeah. Last time these were used was in 96 in this camp. So we're going to take them home now. And if you don't believe it, there's where we started. That's Step it. One. Can you see it there, Ian? Mm hmm. Sure can. We didn't cut very far. So, anyway, 21 years after these things are up here and used we're going to take them home and uh, hang them up in the horse barn so in 2012 don't, 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 don't show over there <laughs> <laughs> 2012 if Ian can still hear me we took that axe out back in 2012 Ian ended up putting a new handle in it also on the stamp on the head of the axe Ian did some research, and that stamp is a Swedish stamp, so that axe was made in Sweden. But we can talk about that later. We get home, back to Arkansas, lay these three items together, and tell the story again, tell about it, and rejoin them. So there we go. Alrighty, so this is the uh, time capsule that we buried this year. Uh, we took the old casing off the old one and put the new one inside of it. Um, in this picture right here is where you can zoom in and see Grand Teton. And then in a few other pictures, uh, when it's finished, you can zoom in and see it as well in the background. Um, but this is the Karn. If anybody wants to go dig it up, uh, there it is. Sign your name at the bottom if you want to um, and bury it again. So that's it. Now, after we buried the time capsule, we made our way back down the mountain. Um, we took a different route and stopped by Muskrat Lake to pump a little bit of water um, so we could drink it on the way down. It was, it was pretty dry up there, so we were pretty thirsty. Um, after Muskrat Lake, uh, which is where my grandpa uh, Lanny uh, camped whenever he came up there with them uh, in 91, I believe, 
Um, after we left there, we went down to Three Duck Lake, which is where the first elk camp was. Uh, Grandpa set it up, had a little corral, um, and him and some local buddies from Jackson hunted there for that year. Um, left Three Duck Lake and made our way down the mountain. And about halfway down, like I said before, it started raining. Um, and for the remainder of the trip, it rained every day. Um, rained or snowed, I would say. Um, and so in the, in the following pictures and videos, you'll see it raining or snowing or, you know, of that nature. Um, and I'll do some voiceovers of, of those parts. But you won't see me talking very much for the, for the remainder of the time in the Grovant. When we get in a snowy range, I'll jump on and, and do a little bit more overview of the trip. Monday, and it's pouring down rain. So we're uh, we're stuck here at the Grove Hunt until it all dries up because the roads are too slick to uh, to get out. So yippee! All right, we'll see you later. Bye. It's the next morning. I talked to you guys last night, and it is now snowing hardcore. So. Uh, if you guys can see it or not. Yeah, we're not getting out of here today. Or tomorrow. Or maybe not the next day. Hey. <laughs> <clears throat> this will be good for the video. Daddy, you want to split this wood still or you want to put limbs on it? Yeah, we pulled that mall out of there yesterday. Sure. <laughs> Alrighty, while we were snowed in down in the Grove on, uh, down at base camp, I did do a little fishing. Next few pictures of a uh, couple cutties that I caught in Soda Lake, about a mile from uh, Goose, Goose Creek Station there in the Grove on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you can see in some of the shadows, there's a little bit of snow left. We just went through a very quick snow flurry. We've had about three of them today. Ian will look over there on Soda Butte. If you can see through the <clears> trees, <throat> that was covered in white not 10 minutes ago. Sun is back out now and everything's kind of melted off real quick. We are absolutely landlocked if you want to call it that right now the uh, road out of here is impassable and we watched a uh, four-wheel drive i don't know if it was a gator what it was they ranger. were spinning ranger they were spinning as they came in we did talk to them and they asked them to at least let the ranger know that we were in here and that if we were still in here wednesday thursday friday kind of check on us so the ranger actually did come up and visit with us a little bit made sure that we were warm and fed. We had all of those luxuries. And talking about this snowstorm here is the fact that today is 19th of September. Tomorrow is the last day of summer <clears throat> and we're dealing with all this. He yeah. didn't get a shot back in those trees back there. You get a lot of the snow's already gone off them now, but you can still see the snow on the trees there. It was really heavy earlier. Now it rained or snowed, if you want to say, Almost about 12 hours solid starting yesterday at about 6.30, 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock range, yeah. Yeah, I'd say about 7 o'clock because we got down about 6.30 we started. So it started raining. I don't know how much it rained. But then it started snowing earlier this morning. I'm not quite sure what time. I woke up around 3, I think. It kind of cleared off a little bit off the top of the tarp. But it looks like on the tarp itself, and some of it melted, but maybe a half inch. Of course, the ground never got that. The ground was plenty warm. A lot of, a lot of snow on top of the plants, but maybe a half inch of snow until it cleared off the first this morning, and then really did a nice job of starting to dry up, clean up a little bit. Now, it's still slick, but, I mean, it was drying up. And somewhere around lunchtime, we were, we were down at the lake fishing, and somewhere around lunchtime, a big old snow squall came in. Lots and lots of big flakes, and heavy snow. <clears throat> I wouldn't call it a whiteout, but it was pretty bad. 
And we're telling the story here at this time, at this camp, because we're not supposed to be here. But because it has gotten so wet and this roads are so slick, we can't get out of here. Yeah, it's impossible. And when the ranger came up and talked to him about the forecast, we may not get out of this week. Today is Tuesday and it may not be any clear up till Sunday or Monday. So who knows? So what our plans are right now is we're going to uh, make it through tomorrow evening. I think tomorrow is going to be the driest day in the next seven days. And so see if it uh, dries up enough for us tomorrow. And then I think if it dries up and freezes, and that's kind of what we're looking at. Well, if we think we can get out tomorrow evening, afternoon, we'll go. But I think what we're looking at now is saying, okay, we're out of here on Thursday morning. Because it's supposed to be 20, 25 degrees. So it'll dry up and then it'll freeze also, solidify at least a little bit because of the ice. Maybe enough to give us some traction. And hopefully we can make it out of here in this big station wagon. There it is, folks. <laughs> a luxury suite. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our fourth flurry for the day. And it uh, seems like it'll be here for a while. Could have been slowed down with that film. Huh? Or was your film behind you? Yep. So, she's snowing again. Um, hopefully it dries up a little bit for us. We are making it out of here. Finally, I'm walking because if they die down this hill, I want to be able to have kids and stuff. So, um, they're going down the hill, slip and sliding, where they came down the mountain. Um, but they're getting down that. Hopefully they can rake it around this corner. Um, which they're doing pretty well. I thought they'd be slip sliding. No, they're starting to slide. Starting to slide. Come on, catch, 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 catch. Okay, so they're doing well. They're getting down. I thought they would be doing a lot worse than this. Let's start running. Yep, there it gets hairy. This is a two-wheel drive Suburban, by the way. Finally getting out. Three days in there is gonna kill me. So what happened was it didn't fall out enough, but the ground froze last night, so we had a solid pack of ice on the mud. So everything was good. I'm gonna load back in here and get going. See you guys. Alrighty, so we made it out of the Grovant. You saw the last video where the truck was going down the muddy hill. Um, made it out of there, and we went to Hoback, like I said before the intro. Um, out of Hoback, we went to Yellowstone and Jackson a few times. Um, so the following pictures and videos will be of, of Yellowstone. And then the last video of me fishing there is in the Snake River right behind the KOA camp we stayed at. Um, but uh, take a look at that, and uh, have fun. You are about to see a picture of a Toyota Land Cruiser converted to a camper. I absolutely love this thing.
So the next few photos you're going to see are of after we left Jackson Hoback area, we went to the Snowy Range um, down there south a little bit, almost to Colorado. Um, and it is absolutely breathtaking beautiful. Uh, I caught a bunch of sunrises and a bunch of sunsets and, and you know, fishing was incredible there. Uh, like I said before, we took some crazy roads to get places. Um, but just check it out. It's, it's a cool, cool place. Like I said before, I caught some beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Um, this is kind of whenever it started snowing again on us. Uh, we got a little bit of fishing in while we were there. Uh, there's Dad. Um, and then you'll see Grandpa here fishing. And then the little uh, rainbow trout that he caught whenever all those bugs were hatching after the thunderstorm. Um, this is right before the sunset. And here in about one second, you'll see the sunset right there. Absolutely breathtaking. This is the next morning sunrise here. And then as we were driving out, I got a shot of the aspens amongst all the pines up there. In the end, this, this trip to Wyoming 2017, um, September 15th through the 24th, 23rd was the drive home, 24th we kind of got home and got unpacked. Um, but it was, it was one of the best trips I've had up there so far. I've been up there three times. Um, I went up there when I was just a baby and then a couple times just on vacation around there. But three times hunting. And it, it, this trip was by far one of the best. I think because I'm a lot older and I'm able to understand um, and really grasp the beauty and, and the meaning of the place. Um, but it, it, was one, it was one heck of a trip. You know, I, I caught fish. I shot a prairie dog. I shot grouse. You know, and the $170 you spend for a fishing and small game license in Wyoming, uh, those, those three things were worth it to me. Um, and, you know... For some people, it's priceless. I mean, I, I would have paid a lot more than that just, for, you know, for that experience. But but once again, like I said earlier, if, if you have an opportunity to go out in the wild and spend some time out there camping or hunting or fishing, you know, any of those things, really take that opportunity um, just to experience what God created. And, and, you know, I say that a lot, but, but I live every, every day nearly what people dream of, of doing in their lifetime. And it's, and it's all because I take those opportunities to immerse myself in nature. Um, and you can really see the artwork that's got, that God's created. So take the time. Have fun. I hope you enjoyed the video. It was kind of long, but it was hard to fit that many days into, into a little video. So once again, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, have a great day. See you all later.